afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the final meeting of the 2023-2024 basketball season for the Birmingham Tip-Off Club. You may have noticed I am not Dick Coffey, uh, our esteemed president. You know, though every good team has to have somebody come off the bench at key moments when a starter is unavailable. Maybe it's an injury, maybe foul trouble. So for today, think of me as the Mohamed Diobate of the Birmingham Tip-Off Club. First things first, you should have, Dick, by the way, is making his way back from Spokane. You should have seen, received in the lobby a survey about the club that we would really appreciate if you would fill out at your leisure and send it in, mail it in. You also will be sent that as an email. Your feedback is extremely important because we want this club to reflect the very high quality of basketball that's being played across this state at every single level. And we're working in that direction. So please make sure you fill out the survey. We don't have a highlight video for you this week. Sheldon Haygood, who's done such a fantastic job this season, was unable to put that together. He had some other obligations. If you're looking for some entertainment, though, I could, you don't want me to, I could sing a song I wrote the other day, The Wreck of the Bucky McMillan. How, first of all, how many of you in here know the song, The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald? Okay, I thought, I thought this crowd, we'd have a pretty good percentage of that. that. That's not an age crack. I love that song, okay? And I don't know what it was Friday night. I couldn't get, Thursday night I should say, I couldn't get that game out of my head. Couldn't get that song out of my head. And so I thought, you know, this was, was an epic event, that game, the way it was played, the way Sanford fell down, the way they came back, the way they were this close to having a shot, the last shot to beat Kansas after some incredible individual plays, a chore, a chore with that tomahawk dunk, and then... I don't care what anybody says wearing striped shirts or not. That chase down block by A.J. State and McCray was the play of the tournament so far. And we all know it was clean. Unfortunately, one man with a whistle thought otherwise. And so I was moved by that. And so I wrote a song to the tune of The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. I will not sing it because I cannot sing. As my wife's, I actually recorded it. It's actually, you can find it on my website, kevinskarbinski.com, the lyrics you can find. I don't have the guts to actually share with you the recorded version of me sing, half singing, half speaking the lyrics. But it's written in couplets, and if you hear the song, The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald, in your head as you read along, I think you'll get what I was trying to do. I'm actually quite proud of it, and I hope you'll check it out. But it's been a special, look, it's been a special year here. For the second time in three years, we had four, count them, four Division I men's basketball teams in this state make the NCAA tournament. Second time in three years, that had never happened before two years ago. That's pretty special. Only one state in the country had more teams in the NCAA tournament. It was Texas with six. And while we wish, of course, they were all still playing, we do have, they, they, they gave us some incredible memories. And this club has been fortunate that we have been visited by Bucky McMillan from Sanford, Nate Oates from Alabama, Bruce Pearl from Auburn, and to complete the circle, today we have Andy Kennedy from UAB. So first of all, and that's just Division I men's. We're going to hear a little bit more about division, a special season by a special Division II women's team. So stay tuned for that a little bit later in the program. So 
We've also been joined this season by three, not one, not two, but three members of the NCAA Division I Men's Basketball Committee. They're the ones responsible for bracketing, seeding, locating the teams in the NCAA tournament. So I guess we can't hold it against Greg Byrne, Martin Newton, and Charles McClelland that they sent UAB, Alabama, and Auburn to Spokane, Washington, and Sanford to Salt Lake City. Maybe, one, maybe they'll come back next year and explain that one to us. And then we were last week fortunate to be joined by three former players from this state who each got one shot at the big dance. And they shared their memories with us, of course. That was Mo Finley, Richard Hendricks, and Bart Heitch. So we've had a great season. We're going to cap it off with a great day today. So that's enough out of me. Let's get started. Joe Daniel, come up and give us and lead us in our invocation and the pledge. What a great time of year basketball season is. And these past four days have been exciting for sure, maybe intriguing to some degree. But anyway, glad you're here today. If you'll please rise and join me in prayer and remain standing for our Pledge of Allegiance. Again, glad everybody's here today and what a great time of year. Father, your word tells us that everything in the heavens and earth is yours. And this is your kingdom. We pause at this time to acknowledge that all that we have and all that we do and all that we are is because of your love and your grace. So we pray for your blessings on each of us as individuals, on our families, our businesses, our schools, and on this club as we seek to serve you through our words and actions each and every day. We thank you for our speaker today, Coach Kennedy, and for his work in this great sport. And we thank you, Lord, for this meal before us, recognizing that it too is a gift from you. All these things we ask for in your most holy name. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I don't know, Coach Ford, every time I come up here and I look at that stage, I think I can make that jump. I can make that jump. But fortunately, I haven't tried it. Thank, thank you, John. John's saying don't. Don't do it. Now we're joined by a former president, a basketball guy through and through, a blazer, Andy Kennedy, which you'll appreciate, our former president, Scotty Colson. I saw Conrad give me one clap. The, uh, this is very short. I'm the head of the nominating committee, and the nominating committee would like to present to you a slate of officers and members of the board. President for another term, Dick Coffey. Jimmy Carlson, vice president. C.J. Glover for secretary. Treasurer, Jim Conrad. On the board, Jimmy Carlson. John Clement, Dick Coffey, Scotty Colson, Jim Conrad, Bruce Petway, William Yarbrough, and Anthony Kingston. We would like to make that as a slate. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, same sign. And back to you, Kevin. Keep it down. It's... Who is the most notable person in college basketball this year? Any guess? It's, uh, gosh, it's, a. Uh, it's the girl from Iowa. What's her name? Yeah. That made a big impression on me. Uh, 
Anyway, uh, her pursuit of the most points in basketball history uh, caught the attention of the nation. All of her games were sold out. Television uh, viewership was several million every time there was a game. Now, she passed uh, Pete Maravich finally in the next to last game, and uh, Pete had had the record for since 1990 where he had the most points of any player, and he scored his in three years, uh, not four. Uh, he didn't have a three-point shot as they have now. But the fact remains, he gradu graduated in 1990, 1970, uh, 53 years before somebody broke his record. That tells you what a great player he was. And uh, I think it has done more for women's basketball probably than anything that's come along. They're now very popular. Uh, and I think men's basketball is, is very popular. But uh, anyway, I'm thinking about 50, 53 years. So that was a great record. But it reminded me of Andy Kennedy's record at UAB. He holds the record for the highest percentage three-point shots made at UAB. And he, did you graduate in 1990? Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so he's had 23 years, and nobody's uh, broke his record. He 43.7 on three-point shots. The best thing about it, he holds the record for the number of three-point sh shots taken in a career. So he's make them, and that's great. So I just, it's one of the things that, it reminded me of uh, how great it is to have Andy Kennedy uh, in our midst and in our community. And uh, I just want to say it's been a great year for the club and a great year for us. Uh, now we'll go to our winners and losers. Let's see if I got that. All right, <laughs> we'll go to the losers first. Uh, I'll start with the third worst. Andy McCurry, 26%. Jim Sasser, 19%. But the winner, I guess loser of the brick, is Scotty Colson. Scotty, I don't know if you want to try to walk up. Remember, we have now got a, a brick you can keep. We've got a plaque on it that says, congratulations on your brick the Birmingham Tip-Off Club. So we've moved up, instead of swapping bricks, you now get a permanent brick. <laughs> All right, and the winner, uh, third from top, 57%, Jimmy Carson. 57%, Nick Weldon, second, 57%. The winner, uh, just won previously, Mac Moore. Mac, is he here? Here's Mac. All right. Already signed by Andy Kennedy. Uh, it says, go Blazers. Here you go, Mac. All right. Well, it's been a great year. Thank you. And uh, let's keep going.
what you wanted? Okay. Just making sure. I mean, I debated it before, but I realized I don't even have to jump. It's not a big deal. <clears throat> All right. So uh, our last high school player of the week, we are going to honor Jody Jones of Fairfield. He is joined today by his coach, Maurice Ford. Um, with over 600 wins, Coach Ford has earned a spot among the top 20 all-time in the state of Alabama, uh, all-time winning, all winningest coaches in the state of Alabama, numerous area championships. I counted 11 Elite Eights. Is that right? I mean, y'all didn't even tell me that. I had to go back and count because he got too many other things going on. Um, impressive he, uh, list of Final Fours, six Final Fours, two state championships, including this year as well as 2020. Um, many scholar athletes under his guidance have gone to play on the collegiate level, and he's even had a couple go to the NBA, which would be uh, Eric Bledsoe and Walter Sharp. So uh, he's <laughs> he's in a uh, small small group of coaches in the state of Alabama that have done the things that, that Coach Ford has accomplished. Um, as for our player of the week, Jody Jones, he's, he was the three-year starter for Fairfield, averaged 18.7 points a game this year. 4.4 rebounds, 3.4 assists, and he shot 43.2% from three, so almost as good as Andy Kennedy. Really close. Um, scored over 1,850 points, grabbed 370-plus rebounds, 300-plus assists, and over 200 steals throughout his career. He was three-time All-Area, two-time All-Region, three-time All-State, including first-team All-State this year. 2024 regional MVP and state tournament MVP as they won the state championship this year. Just a quick remark from his coach. As Jody's coach, I can attest that he has been an absolute pleasure to coach. He's dedicated to his team, hardworking, a powerful leader on and off the court. His refuse to lose mentality is truly admirable, and I'm proud to have witnessed his determination firsthand. I distinctly remember Jody telling me that he was going to win a championship before he graduated, and true to his word, he achieved that goal. Our player of the week, Jody Jones. Good morning. Uh, I do want to thank God for the opportunity, my family and coaching staff and the rest of the village for supporting me along the way. I can't wait to see what's next. Thanks again. Wait, in my younger days, my ego would have got the better of me, and I, you know I would have tried to to do that, but I've gained a little bit of sense through the years. I've also had the privilege to get to know people like Coach Maurice Ford, and Jody, congratulations. The rest of the story, of course, and I don't know how many of you know that Coach Ford's best friend, Coach Reginald McGarry, passed away at the start of this season. And everyone called him Cave, Coach Cave. The team dedicated the season to Coach McGarry. Their shooting shirts the day of the championship game honored Coach Cave. And that would be an amazing story that they brought it home, that a season that started with a loss, a personal loss, a painful loss, ended with the ultimate victory. But it didn't stop there. On the day of the championship game, another friend of Coach Ford, Coach Kenneth Threadgill, who had a lot of success in this state passed away as well. One of the assistants at Fairfield learned of Coach Threadgill's death, but he did that with that, with them being that close to tipping off the championship game, he didn't tell Coach Ford and the players. But they went out and did what they do. They played like champions. They won the championship. And a season that started with a loss and ended with a loss also included a state championship, which tied Maurice Ford with Reginald McGarry with two state championships. So those are the kind of special stories that high school basketball and basketball at every level bring to us here in the state of Alabama. So I want to say a special congratulations to Fairfield and Coach Ford. 
and Jody as well. And we don't always, including myself, shine a spotlight where we should on great work being done, on historic accomplishments being achieved. But we're going to make up for lost time a little bit today by honoring the Miles College Lady Bears and Coach Pete Asman. For the first time in school history, they won the SIAC Women's Basketball Tournament. They advanced to the NCAA tournament. And while they were defeated by the number one seed, Valdosta, on the road, it's one of the features of women's basketball is you have to play tournament games, some tournament games on the road. They concluded the best season in school history, a school record of 23 wins. And I could go on and on in just your second year coach, is that right, as the head coach of the Miles women. But it was an interesting road for him to get two miles, and we'll let him tell you that because we've got a special award to honor Coach Pete Asmond and the Miles Lady Bears. Coach, come on up. Good afternoon. Um, first and foremost, I want to just thank God um, for giving me this opportunity to have me in this position. I want to thank the administration, um, President Knight, um, A.D. Watson, for giving me this opportunity to even be here today. Um, like um, Kevin said, yeah, this is my second year on the women's side, but I've been coaching basketball for about 16 years now, um, mostly on the men's side with Coach Watson. I'm originally at Benedict College, where we were able to cure mm -hmm. Um, for um, SIEC tournament championships um, as an assistant, then moving forward um, at Miles last three years before that, we were able to accrue two um, SIEC championships. So with that being said, when the opportunity was given for me to take over the women's program, um, Coach Watson came to me and he asked me, you know, have you ever thought about coaching women's basketball? Actually, I'm like, no, I haven't. I, haven't. <laughs> I never um, thought about coaching women's basketball. But the opportunity presented itself. He thought I was ready um, to step in the um, field of shoes as a head coach, and um, I decided to take on that challenge. Then the first year, we were able to get to the SIEC tournament, actually tying the school record in wins with 21 wins. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to, you know, come away with the win that year. But um, a season later, the young ladies were focused. I was able to bring back a good core, and they were dedicated to the task of making sure we were going to right that wrong this upcoming season. Um, we just put the process in place. They were dedicated to the, um, the journey, and we were able to accomplish that goal. So I appreciate you guys having me here for it. Watson, stand up. The, in, on the men's side and the women's side, best seasons in recent years in Miles history. So when you get a chance, get out and see everyone play. I know it's hard. There's only seven days a week. We all have we all have day jobs. But what's your good side? <laughs> but that's just an example of the good things that they're doing in Miles, and we appreciate it, both coaches. Congratulations, so thank you. I don't really. I don't really need notes for Andy Kennedy. Andy called me yesterday and said he wanted to have, rather than him standing up and speaking to you, he said, let's just have a conversation. We've had a few of those through the years. I thought it'd be better for you guys. You know, we could kind of talk about a number of things. Now, I'm, I am more than well prepared to give you 20 minutes on UAB basketball and the great job that was just uh, accomplished there. But I, I thought it would be a little better if we could just kind of talk about in general, as you said, uh, incredible year of success in the intercollegiate basketball for the state of Alabama. You know, I'm so proud of Bucky. I've made this uh, a point a number of years. When, when I was working for Murray in the mid-90s as an assistant coach at UAB, uh, I remember Bucky and his dad, they would come to our camps in uh, uh, the old, I think it was called the Birmingham Ice, believe it or not, way back when, and seeing little Bucky and how he is, 
uh, done just an incredible job of, of bringing such a passion and energy, uh, not only to his run at Mountain Brook High, but then to go to Sanford. I've known Martin Newton forever. His, his late great father, CM, recruited me out of high school. Martin and I go back to the 1980s. My daughter got her MBA uh, at Samford. Every time I drive on that campus, I'm looking for a street to be named after me with the amount of money I spent. But I, still, I haven't seen that, but I, I'm really proud of, of, of Samford and what they, what they achieved. Obviously, what Bruce has done and what Nate have done uh, at Alabama and Auburn uh, go without saying. And, and I'm just proud that we could be back in that conversation. That's why it's all the more significant that in Andy's four years as head coach at UAB, Guess who has the most wins in the state? UAB. You are, I think, one behind in conference regular season wins behind Nate and Alabama. You are, let me get my numbers right. You are nine and two in conference tournaments with two championships in two different leagues, by the way, in the last three years, Conference USA and then the American Athletic Conference this year, which gives you three in three different leagues when you go back to Ole Miss, where you won an SEC tournament. That puts you in, in the company of people like John Calipari, your good friend Bob Huggins. I think Rick Pitino set the record with six. You're not going to go for six, are you? Hey, you never six know. different conference never, championships we, 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 in different we, we, tournaments. We could be in six by the time this meeting is over uh, <laughs> with, with, with the way that the world is shifting around us. Uh, no, and, and let me add, you know, we've, we, I think we were ninth. I think we've got the ninth most wins in college basketball over the last four years. So we've had some success. Um, you know, um, you, as a coach, you always want one more. Aren't we greedy? You just want one more. Can we just get one more? Just get one more. But I, I've said this a number of times, and I'll, I'll reiterate it today. I've been a head coach for 17 years. Don't let these good looks fool you. Uh, as Coach Bartow used to say, Lord, lap the track. Just keep lapping. I've taken a few laps around that track. Uh, and so... It's 17 years as a head coach, I've never had a team grow as much as this last team. From where we started to where we finished, uh, incredibly proud of the growth of that team because perseverance is very, very valuable. Perseverance is, is easy to talk about on a stage uh, with Kevin, but perseverance is hard to live. And our group was sitting at four and five. We'd lost three in a row, two of which by double figures mid-December, no identity, uh, a lot of questions, very few answers, but our guys continued to work. Now, they didn't believe, and they didn't trust, but they worked. And we always talk about, hey, man, uh, the grind only respects the work, so put in the work. Let's stack work. Let's stack work. And then at the end of the day, when you stand on that stack in March, I promise you, you're going to like your view. So we, the game that kind of turned it for us, we came back, we won a couple of games. Then we had Drake, the Drake Bulldogs. Uh, uh, Darren DeVries, a friend of mine, just got West Virginia. I'm really excited for him. But Drake's had a tremendous program. As I, I said, we were ninth in most wins over the last four years in college basketball out of 362 programs. Drake is sixth, so they have had a tremendous run. Um, and, and you would say, why are UAB and Drake playing? Because no one will play us. You know, it's, it's difficult. It's very, very difficult to get Power Fives to play us. Um, and it was difficult for him to find opportunities as well. So we did a home-and-home and they come to, to Birmingham uh, early December, or, uh, right before Christmas. The get-out game made me nervous because, you know, sometimes that game right before Christmas, kids are already thinking about the, what they're going to do in their time off. We were able to win the game in overtime. And after that, I could sense a belief. Now we're having tangible results. Now they're starting to believe that if we take this approach, we can be successful. Then we had to develop the discipline to stay to that approach. That's a discipline, you know, this is how, this is how we win. It's not gonna be easy, it's gonna be a grind. We've gotta to commit to these things. And so you, then you have to develop the discipline to stay on that path. And again, uh, up and down, like all teams, everybody's trying to win. I tell people that all the time. The other team's trying to win too. Uh, and so sometimes, you know, things don't go exactly as planned, but our guys worked, believed, and started to trust. Now, I, I would like for them to trust me, but more importantly, I want them to trust each other. And that's what we developed heading into uh, uh, the conference tournament. And then we had a terrific run. Again, I, I would have loved to have faced that when, when I've, I've told the story. So we were in the late window on Sunday of the AAC. Uh, we're with the worldwide leader. 
Uh, that's the one thing that the American Conference has done for us. No longer do you have to fumble around and try to find stadium TV. What the hell? I mean, you, you, can, go to, you can go to ESPN and see the Blazers. Uh, so we, we played at like 2.15, I think the tip was. It was a relatively quick game. We kind of got control, not a lot of fouls. Win the game. Uh, you know, by the time I get all the confetti out of my hair and I, I get the trophy and we climb up that ladder. You know, they tell you as a kid, you're never supposed to climb stairs with scissors, but I'm going to tell you what, it's a hell of a thing for an adult. Uh, so we got to walk up there with those scissors and cut down those nets, and uh, then there's some media obligations. So literally, we still hadn't left the arena. So literally, uh, it's 4.59 when I leave the dais. They whisk me upstairs. Uh, I walk into the room that they have the selection show on, and I'm not in the room 30 seconds, and I see us pop up. Well, immediately, and so I see us pop up, and everybody's doing their thing, and I see San Diego State, so my celebratory mood had, had, had diminished a bit. Uh, and then I see Auburn and Yale, and those, that's all I saw. Then I whisk out of the room, and we go back, and planes, trains, and automobiles trying to get the Blazers home. So uh, I didn't know Alabama was in Spokane. I, you know, obviously, I knew Auburn was there. Boy, and I would have loved, back when I played you know, with Coach Bartow, uh, we would play Auburn every year, and that, that kind of stopped, I think, in the Cliff Ellis days. I'd, I'd love to get that back. Uh, where we, we had an opportunity to, to, to play Auburn every once in a while. But I would have loved to have had the opportunity to play them in the Sweet 16. Unfortunately for us and them, it wasn't in the cards. But really, really proud of my group, proud of, of uh, them being best version of self, which is our ultimate goal. And as a coach, you just want your team ultimately to reach its potential. And I think this team did is about as close as any I've ever coached. Patience is not a hallmark of fans, obviously. And... I know it's sometimes hard for coaches. Do you have to be more patient than ever with the transfer portal? You brought in three of the top ten junior college players in America after last year. You lost key pieces like Jelly Walker. We all know the incredible things that he accomplished. Trey Jemison. And, and Trey Jemison, Trey who's, who's only NBA. playing in the NBA right now. Yeah, he, I, let's talk about him for just a second, Kevin. What an incredible story. This kid, uh, local product, I, 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 I affectionately – refer to him as the mayor, uh, no offense, Randall, but eventually uh, I think Trey could come back here and be the mayor of Birmingham. He just checks all the boxes. I mean, incredible kid, incredible energy, a giver, loves this community. We were very, very fortunate to get him back during the COVID year. Uh, we got him for the, for, the, for the plus one, so I had him for three years. He helped us win 78 games. He was an all-league player and really anchored us on some tremendous teams. The kid you know, he wasn't always – I used to joke with him all the time. We'd have these shooting drills, and I would literally have to, like, leave the building when he was doing it because it was just so demoralizing. I, I, I think, you know, Dick, you had said I, 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 was, a, I was a pretty good shooter, and, and, I, and I used to tell him every day, I'd say, Trey, I think I could beat you shooting in boxing gloves. I, I think I could put boxing gloves on and beat him in horse. Uh, so his touch was less than stellar, but he's big, he's strong, he works, his spirit is so strong. And I just said, man, if he can get in the right situation, people are going to want him to be on their team. Lo and behold, he goes through what he went through with the, the, the G League, and then he gets a 10-day with Portland, and they release him. Then he gets another 10-day with Memphis. They sign him to a two-way, and I think he's on, on a, uh, a trajectory to get a long-term deal. That's the goal. He scored 24 points uh, in a game last week. 24 points in an NBA game are the most ever by a UAB Blazer uh, in history in an NBA game. Uh, tremendous, tremendous future for that kid. And then Jelly Walker's getting like 20 points per game in the – in the G League, he, uh, he, he went into China to try to chase some money a little bit, and um, hopefully he comes back. I said, you do know they're communists, right? But anyway, uh, uh, so he's, he's there. Hopefully we can get him back in one piece, and uh, yeah, proud of those guys. And, and stepping into that tradition, among those three top JUCO recruits you brought in, each of those guys, and we saw Alejandro and Daniel step up in the AAC tournament in a big way. But the steadying influence throughout the year has been Yaxel Lendeborg. Did he surprise you at all? Is that what you expected out of him? And please tell us that he'll be coming back. Well, I want to pass the hats. Anybody got a hat? Uh, it, it, it's, it's crazy. Uh, he, he will have to give us a real hometown discount. Uh, it's bananas what's going on in, in the world. Now, he's not in the portal, but that doesn't stop him. Uh, I met with him yesterday, and I can show you DM after DM the, the – uh, he would be one of the highest paid guys in the room, and I know there's some rich guys looking at you guys, looking at you especially in the middle there. Uh, I, but we signed three JUCO kids, 
two of which had never played Division One basketball. Alejandro Vasquez had started out at, at St. Bonaventure, and he'd kind of gone through a different um, variety of things. He scores 29 points, which was a UAB record for most points scored in a conference tournament game, and he did it in the conference tournament finals against against Temple. He scored 21 in the first half to really kind of put that thing away pretty quickly. Um, Chris Coleman from Winsboro, Louisiana at 6'1", 160 pounds when he graduated, had no options, went to work for Walmart. We all have stories. We all got stories about, you know, our, our jobs that we've had along our way. He went to work for Walmart for two years, grew to six foot seven. Um, he still played uh, basketball, and one of his one of his one of his guys, one of his buddies, had an opportunity to work out at LSU Alexandria NAI school in Alexandria, uh, Louisiana. He didn't have a ride. Chris had a car. Uh, Chris took him down there. Uh, they said, "Hey, you want to get in the game?" They put him in the game, offered him a scholarship. He ended up being freshman of the year in that league. He then transferred to a junior college because he wanted to go to Division One. It just so happens his junior college coach worked for me for six years at Ole Miss. Uh, so we signed the number two rated junior college player in the country. And he comes here and he, and he lived out a dream, you know, never in a million years would he have imagined he had had that opportunity. Then Yaxel Lindenborg. Yaxel played 11 games of high school basketball. His mother and father, Yaxel's Dominican. His mother and father are both professional players. Uh, Yaxel was not eligible to play in high school until the second semester of his senior year because he basically, he has three younger sisters and he basically missed like 82 days of school, his junior, I mean, taking care of his, his siblings. Uh, he, he told me all the time he still does not have a driver's license. We got him one in Alabama, but he drove for years in New Jersey. I think that's normal in New Jersey, but he, he, dro he, dro he drove for years there just, just transporting his, his daughters around or his uh, sisters around. He, uh, he then goes to, uh, have you guys seen, you guys like Russell Crowe, 310 to Yuma, the movie? You seen the movie? It's a great movie, right? Well, the reason, do you, have you seen the movie, 310 to yes. Yuma? Yes. Well, the reason that that's significant, because that's right on the Mexican border. Well, well Yaks, again, had no opportunities because he's a non-qualifier. He only played 11 high school games. They went 10 and 1, by the way. Uh, he went to an outdoor workout that was put on by a Dominican man trying to help Dominican kids. Somebody sees him, says, hey, I've got a junior college friend. Let me call him. They took him sight unseen, and he was in Yuma at Arizona Western. He ends up being a terrific player. We tried to recruit him the summer before uh, his sophomore campaign there, and we couldn't get a sniff. He's, he's, he's visited Memphis, Houston, Xavier, and St. John's. He signs with St. John's. Uh, Mike Anderson, formerly of a Birmingham native, formerly of UAB fame, and uh, Mike gets released at the end of the year. So then he becomes available. We find a hook. We end up getting him. And I knew. I, I told people this. I told Steve Mitchell this. Who I, Steve Mitchell and Oliver Robinson are the two greatest Blazers in the history of the program. And I told them both this. I said, Hey, you guys may have to move over a little bit. Um, and you know, when he went 0 and 8, I think he went 0 for 8 and fouled out in 13 minutes against Bradley in our overtime loss. They were looking at me like. Okay, you got to let that. You got to get off that juice, man. You be just, <laughs> what? Uh, and I said, hey, man, just hang in here with him. Hang in here with him. He, he's going to be the guy. Uh, I think he's he's an incredible player, uh, and he's a better person. And I'm working like hell to make sure we keep him as a blazer. Well, we certainly hope that you're able to get that done. Now, I don't think there are any AAC officials or NCAA officials in the room, and this is all off the record. So, unfortunately, in your NCAA tournament game against uh, San Diego State, Yaxel got a tight whistle. He got three early fouls, got his fourth foul, I think, with 14 minutes left, had to play through that. One thing that's been a theme throughout this first weekend of the tournament has been, we already mentioned the Sanford block phantom foul, the inconsistency in officiating. How, did, how do you approach that with your players before a game, do you think, because we've heard a lot of this about Auburn's Chad Baker Mazzara, that his reputation preceded him, that the officials were looking for him and gave him that flagrant two early in the, the Yale game, which obviously disrupted them. But how do you approach that when you, maybe guys you haven't seen, officials who haven't seen your team, do you even address it? Yeah, you know what's crazy is like you never know in the NCAA tournament, you don't know until 60 minutes before the game. And they don't necessarily have to be West Coast guys just because we were out there. Uh, and, the, and that's where it, 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 I don't know the formula by which they set up who officiates which game. I knew two of the three guys. As a matter of fact, 
uh, one of the three we had had numerous times. I had a little bit of a rapport with him. Uh, and then the other guy, he'll be, he'll be in the final four, Kip Kissinger. Um, and the other guy I'd never seen before, young guy, and he's the one that, that kind of dinged us a little bit. It's a very, very difficult. I, I have a different relationship. I don't know if you saw I got, I got ejected from the game at Memphis. Uh, I'd never been ejected we saw. before. Yeah, 17 years I've never been ejected. as a, I've coached almost 600 games as a Division One coach, and I've, I've never been ejected before that moment. I've actually, it was my first and second technical foul since I've been at UAB. I hadn't had a technical. I just don't do it that way. I, I, I have my way of making points, and trust me, I, I get my point across, but I'm just not, uh, officials aren't going to react good to that. So what are we trying to get accomplished? I think passion's good. When you get emotional, it's bad. It clouds judgment. And honestly, when I got ejected, not to digress back to this, but when I got ejected against Memphis, the first one was intentional, uh, and it was by a respected guy, a guy I respect, and it was intentional. And then, uh, uh, because I knew when I charged at him, he, I, I gave him no option. And it was trying to, you know, we, we had played really good, and it was slipping. I was trying to get a little bit of a charge, change the, the mindset of my team. So it was intentional, and then he, then he wouldn't acknowledge me, and it pissed me off, quite frankly. And he wouldn't acknowledge me, and I just, I, I wouldn't stop. And so I got dinged. Uh, but again, that wasn't the, the intent. Uh, going into the NCAA tournament, these guys are judged. They're they're surviving advance too. Now there's some that are gonna that are gonna advance. They already know who's gonna be in the final four. But some of these younger guys, they're they are really really worried about can I get you know because they're being evaluated as well. And when it's happening real time, I go back and look at the tape, and I'm gonna be honest with you, 90% of the time they're right. But when they're not right in the moment, I, I think a good official has to, number one, he needs to get the calls right. And I have this conversation with the, with the head of officiating. Get the calls right, man, number one. Number two, you need to have a feel, like a player. You need to have a feel for the game. You need to be aware of what's going on. Uh, on Yaxel's fourth, with it, I think it was like 15-32 in the second half, and it was on a bang-bang play. Can you just not give them the ball? No big deal, man. Hey, no, now he's got four. Now I have to sit him. It changes the game. That, that's feel or lack thereof. And then you've got to have the ability to communicate a little bit. And some of these guys now are so robotic. And they're good in certain areas, but they're, they're really terrible as it relates to communicating. But um, I, think, I think reputation does proceed. I think, uh, I think these guys watch, and they have this perceived notion of how certain guys are going to play. I think they understood that San Diego State is really physical. We're physical. Uh, we kind of play a myriad style. They had the best player, Jaden Ledee, the best player we played all year. He's an All-American for a reason, and he played like an All-American. He was the difference in the game. But foul trouble certainly influenced the way that we were going to play. And then I didn't even see, again, I come back, and obviously we're done, and they're trying to whisk us out of there. Um, and, I'm, and so I, I got the Auburn game on, but I'm really not watching, and then I, get, I have to do some other things, and I come back. So I didn't see it real time. I only saw it after the fact, and they just deemed it a non-basketball play, and it just fell under the definition of ejection. And, again, it goes back to feel. They could have easily slid flagrant one as opposed to two and not got ejected. Obviously a huge blow for the Tigers. Yes, and, and obviously and, and Auburn is a good subject because obviously so many casual fans who don't follow the game 12 months a year, they're not there in November paying attention they see what happens in the NCAA tournament. And when you've had a special season in the regular season, Auburn was 13-5 and five in the SEC, tied for second, one game behind Tennessee. Then they go and they win the SEC tournament. And they don't play the top three seeds, but they beat three teams that are going to the NCAA tournament and they handle them pretty thoroughly. But everybody's going to remember Yale. How do you as a coach look at it in terms of your own – Evaluating yourself and your own program, regular season versus postseason. Well, it's how in, in our world uh, uh, we are at UAB, at Samford, at Auburn, at Alabama, at Troy, at South Alabama. You're judged by one thing. Did you get to the NCAA tournament? Now, if you can advance in that tournament, great. But did you get there? Because that, that, that brings credibility. It means it was a successful season. I am for, and I don't know if we want to go down this path early, but but I am for tournament expansion, 100%. Uh, think about this now. And I know a lot of people, and everybody's like, oh, we can't do it. Why would you mess it up? It's, oh, it's a perfect model. Come on, man. We'll all adjust. We're adjusting to uh, 2024 in America, aren't we? 
It's a little different than it was in 2023, certainly different than it was in 1986 when I was coming out of high school. You just kind of adjust. I remember when they were like, hey, interleague play in baseball. Oh, it'll never work. We do there, you adjust. Hey, we, we're adding a, a playoff team in the NFL. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. There's 18 teams in the SEC on their way to 22. You're still going to watch. You're still going to adjust. So I, I think for us, meaning the UABs of the world, the G5s, quote, unquote, uh, they're going to pinch us right out of this thing. Uh, it's, it, it's coming, guys. Um, why? And, and I love Greg Sankey. I think he's, I think he's brilliant. Uh, I do. He's a friend of mine. Uh, and he's doing what he should do as the commissioner of the SEC. He's trying to protect the interest of a Super League. And so he's looking at, you know, he's made the comments about, you know, the automatic qualifiers, and those are valuable pieces of property. Uh, because now he's got to sit up in front of his members and say, all right, there's 20 of us. I, I got to figure out a way to get 10 of you to the, S, to the NCAA tournament or 12 of you to the NCAA tournament because you're worthy because you're going to eat one another through, along the way. So I, th I think we are working towards tournament expansion. Um, I don't know what that number is. I'm not smart enough to give you how it will all break down. But a, a few days here or there, I think everybody will watch. There will be more monies in the coffers in order to continue to pay this, this uh, monster that we have created. Um, for us, though, yes, the, getting to the NCAA tournament, is, is, again, validity for your program. There's also a monetary um, uh, thing that comes with that. And, and the branding, you know, having the opportunity to showcase UAB, Samford, the notoriety that you get from those runs, you can't, you can't pay for it. Uh, Grand Canyon, no one even knew what Grand Canyon was, Grand Canyon University. They were in our hotel, by the way. Uh, and now, you know, uh, be, based on the success that they've had through athletics, um, it's tremendous, tremendously beneficial, and I think UAB has certainly experienced that. Don't want to get political here, but someone, oh, I know who, it was John Solomon, a friend of mine, used to work with me at, at AL.com. Now he works with uh, Aspen Sports and Society, and he t uh, tweeted Aspen me, Sports and Society? Yeah, the you, Aspen, you know the Aspen Institute, and they, they deal with youth sports, and John's a good guy with a good heart. Doesn't always get it, okay? I think this was. I know a, a lot of those guys. This was a. I think this was a case. He tweeted me and said, "Why did UAB wear jerseys in the NCAA tournament with an opportunity for branding, as you mentioned, that said Birmingham, and not UAB?" And I explained obviously that you wear these, have worn these for years. It goes back to I believe back to Coach Barto at special moments, and I don't know that he fully understood. Can you? Give us a little insight into choosing. You never, wouldn't think choosing a jersey or a uniform would be a big deal, but to some people it is. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's pretty astute by him looking. I mean, he's looking at it like, why would they do that? The he, lives, he lives in Maryland. Yeah. He's not here anymore. He's moved, he moved away some years ago. I'll give, you, I'll give you the easy answer. I asked the players what they wanted to wear, and that's what they wanted to wear, so that's what we wore. It's their team. They, they earned the right to be there, um, and they wanted to wear Birmingham. They wanted to represent the city. So I said, let's do it. That's the best answer possible. Now, do you, as a coach, obviously you are, you're zoned in on your first opponent, on San Diego State. Once you see that bracket, and you noticed Auburn, obviously, and the, obviously the thought of possibly playing them in the second round runs through your head, but you've got to put everything into San Diego State. But once the tournament ends for you, how much are you paying attention? How much are you watching? We know you've got work to do, probably more work than coaches ever had to do at this time of year with the transfer portal and NIL. Are you watching? Are you paying attention here and there to other games? Do you have a feel for who the best team in the country is, who you expect to win the national championship, who you, who you think will be in the Final Four? Yeah, I watch it. Like yesterday, for instance, you know, we, we got back when you, when you lose. I don't know when Auburn came back. But when, when, you know, they, they get you out of there pretty quick because they need the hardware. They need the planes. You know, they, they have to, they have, they're flying people all over the country. That's another thing. Uh, again, don't let me hijack this, bring us back to this. But think about this. I was just discussing it at the table, and, uh, and you had three members of the selection committee up here and – Sometimes I don't even think they understand. They don't control some things. You know, I, I think once the seating is done, then the locations are done separate. I don't think they sit in the room. The selection committee sits in the room and says, okay, let's send Alabama, Auburn, and UAB to Spokane. I don't think they do that. If I, I remember, if I, I remember. it's computer generated. That's it. Someone, that's what they told us. Basically, they have computer programs with certain principles. 
when you can play, how early you can play a team you've already right. played, right. that kind of thing. And there's a lot of parameters in that. So they, as they're building the bracket, there's a lot of things that, that they, they have to work through, especially you know with leagues that are getting numerous teams because they're trying not to cross them too early in the tournament. But think about this. They, they flew all four of us west. Now, they, the NCAA pays for this. For, they, they pay for a travel party of 75. They pay all your expenses, and they charter you out there. So they chartered us out there on a big plane. I think it was a 737. It's a big plane. So they charter us five hours out there, and then as soon as it's over, man, I'm telling you, about five hours later that we were coming back. My guess would be that's about a $200,000 expenditure, which they did four times. So basically a million dollars to travel people just makes no sense. Don't you think that money could have been better used somewhere else, the NCAA? That's, what I, that's the question I would ask. I made the joke like, you know those big wall maps? We need to all invest. Dick, I'm going to put you, or uh, uh, Jim. Jim, I'm going to put you in charge of this. If, if, if we could raise a little money and just send it to Indianapolis, put that wall map up there, so when they're starting to think about these things, maybe they look geographically, that doesn't make sense. But it, I mean, it's an $800,000 expense to fly these people, and then they flew Oregon to Pittsburgh. They flew New Mexico to uh, Memphis. Come on, man. I, I, I think there could be a little sounder business aspect to it. It just shows you how much money's out there. I mean, it, it, CBS does pay a billion with a B on the deal. Um, but, yeah, I do pay attention. Uh, so we came back, goodness, what is today? Monday, we came back uh, late, late. We got in late, late Friday night. Hey, hey, just a tip, I would not charter into the old Birmingham Shuttlesworth Airport at 1 o'clock in the morning on a Friday if you can help it. Uh, not a lot of personnel on the ground there, buddy. Uh, so, so we finally, I got home in the wee hours. Uh, I'm trying to calibrate what I got to do. Yesterday, I, I, I had my TV on. And you know how it does, you turn it on, and you're trying to see the games. It's the afternoon, and you're trying to, to watch the games, and you, you get a call, and you mute it. Well, I muted it, and it stayed on mute for about seven and a half hours. But I, but I was continuing to watch, you know, different games. I never unmuted the television. So, yeah, I do watch. I'm a fan. I've, I've got friends. I've got rooting interest. Uh, you know, I'm fascinated by, you know, certain people that, that we've played or, or that I'm pulling for. Uh, so, yeah, I, I certainly watch. I, I actually calculated driving distance for each of the 68 teams to their first-round game. The four teams from Alabama – were among the eight that had the longest distance to travel. I just hate it for our fans. I mean, you know, I, when you when you have this, you you want to you want to have this bowl like you know, and 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 again, in, in basketball, there's 68 out of 362 go to the NCAA tournament. Now, again, I'm not quite as dumb as I look. I know that's less than 19 percent. In football, there's 41 bowl games, 82 teams out of 130, 67, 68 percent go to postseason. Now. Uh, Hugh Freeze is a friend of mine, so I can say this. I'm not trying to piss any Auburn people off. But it, they went to the Birmingham Bowl last year, and everybody was happy about that. He better not go back, right? <laughs> but, but, going, but going to a bowl game is, you know, it, 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 it would be huge. I mean, Trent, needs, you know, he's not trying to go to a bowl game next year at UAB. It's huge. And your chances of getting to a bowl game at 500 uh, are, are a lot better than going to the NCAA tournament. But in the people's mind, they equate. It, it equates to success. So I, I'm for trying to get that number where it, it's reasonable um, and, and to make sure that they don't squeeze the little guy out. All right, break down for us the Sweet 16 game that could have been UAB-UConn, could have been Auburn-UConn in Boston. Instead, it will be San Diego State-UConn, which we saw in the national championship game last year. Yeah, what's crazy is like two years ago uh, when, we, when we win the conference USA tournament championship um, and we're going to the NCAA tournament, well, we played that game on Saturday. So we played in Frisco Saturday. We beat Louisiana Tech. We fly back. So we had a, a little party at Iron City, and we knew we were going to see our name on the line, so there was no pressure. We're just waiting to see, you know, who, when, and where. I was praying for a Friday night game because we just played three and three, and Trey had had some knee situations. So I was hoping for Friday. They gave us Friday. They put us in Pittsburgh, and then I saw Houston pop up there. Now, Houston was fourth in the Ken Palm, meaning the analytics rating, but they got a five seed, the most underseeded five in the history of basketball. And I knew my, my immediate thought was just breaking out the football pads the next three days to prepare my guys for the physicality of playing Houston. So I, I thought it was a bad draw for us, and it was a bad draw. Uh, our guys fought valiantly, but we just did not have the manpower to overcome them. So this, this year I was hoping to stay 
regionally where it would be better for our fans. I was hoping to get Friday, and I was hoping not to get the most physical team on the West Coast. Well, I got one out of three. I got Friday. Uh, and, and we got San Diego State, who's like Houston a little bit in their physicality and their toughness and the, the way they just I, – I knew it wasn't going to be easy for us, but I thought our guys met the challenge. And, and I thought, again, I was telling you, they've got an All-American, Jaden Ledee, who I think is going to end up being a 10-year pro. I think he reminds me a lot of, of, of Grant Williams at Tennessee and Danny Fortson from back in those days, for those of you who can remember Danny Fortson. He's a rugged guy, plays so hard, tremendous respect. For Brian Dutcher, I've known Brian Dutcher for 100 years. Tremendous respect for what they've been able to do with their program. Played for the national championship last year. I don't think, I mean, again, it's not best of seven. It's one of one. Are they capable of beating UConn? Without question. Um, I didn't I hadn't seen what Vegas said, but I would bet it's eight, nine-point favor. I mean, I would bet UConn is going to be the prohibited favorite. and That's where my money would go, Jim, not that you – not that you're a gambler, but I, I would probably say UConn would advance past that. I think they're the best team in college basketball. Yeah, the metrics say clearly the best team. Were you surprised 13, and, and sorry, Auburn fans, to bring this up, but of the top 14 Ken Palm teams in the rankings at the end of the conference tournaments, 13 of the 14 are in the Sweet 16. Wow. Only one is not. And that's Auburn, which was number four. And that's a prescription for a Final Four team and maybe a national championship team being ranked that high. Were you surprised, obviously, at yeah. Auburn, Yale? And, and I'm going to be honest with you, I didn't see a lot of it because of the circumstances. I didn't see a lot of it real time. But, yeah, I was very surprised uh, when I saw that because I thought Auburn was built for a deep run. They have experience. They play this chaotic style where they don't necessarily have to be making shots. Now, we all want our teams to make shots, but they could withstand that. They've got John A. Broom inside, so they've got an anchor offensively, defensively. I'm a big Jalen Williams fan. I think he, he's really what college basketball is all about, a guy that was a role player, could have dipped, could have left, could have got frustrated, stayed the course, man, and just turned into one of the best players in the history of their program from a production standpoint. Uh, so, yeah, I was surprised, and I think it's just one of those times. It's what makes March Madness so intriguing. It's what it gets the common fans' attention because you just never know. Um, and and I, I was certainly uh, surprised by that. But again, uh, things happen in this game. You know, sometimes losing is the price of competition. All right, off the record, just between us, and then we'll get a couple of questions from the audience. Auburn broke through the, the glass ceiling for the state getting to the Final Four five years ago. Obviously, you want that to be UAB. But as a coach in this state, as someone who played in this state, knowing all the great players and coaches that have come through this state, do you secretly kind of want to see Alabama get there? Or does it – I know it doesn't necessarily help you, but some of us love to see all of the teams in the state do well, especially this time of year. It brands the state – Helps in recruiting, I would think, for everyone. They say a rising tide, no pun intended, lifts all boats. What Would it mean anything to UAB if Alabama gets to the Final Four and then if they were to go on and win the national title? I, don't, I mean, it, 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 it makes some people mad. It wouldn't make me mad. I like Nate. I, 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 I am a, a fan of good basketball. I think they play a very unique style. And I think they always are going to have a chance because of their ability to score. They can really score. And I know Nate has been critical of their defense, but their defense has gotten better. And when you're not playing a common opponents, that defense is probably not as bad because people just don't know you as well as they do throughout the, the rigors of an SEC slate. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know. Who do they play? Who do they play next? North Carolina. Yeah, that'll be a heck of a game. In Los Angeles, and by the way, I love, you know, I love history uh, of the sport. I love history in general. They're playing in the Crypto.com Arena, home of the Lakers, where a undersized, overlooked, left-handed guard named Derek Fisher helped the Lakers win five NBA titles. And to further this, Derek Fisher's last two years in college at Arkansas Little Rock, he was coached by... Wimp Sanderson. Wimp Sanderson. Yeah. My, my first year... Mark Sears is an undersized, no, formerly right. overlooked left-hander who is whose development has been amazing to watch. That's so. a great comparison. At my first year in coaching, I coached for Ronnie Arrow in uh, South Alabama. I think it was the 94, 95, or 95, 96 season. And uh, we were in the league with, with Derek Fisher. He was a senior that year. So I'm, I'm certainly – that's a great analogy, though. I, and Mark Sears, wow, what a terrific player he has been. Uh, what, a, what a great run they've had. 
And, and again, let, let, yeah, let's get some, get some questions from you guys. Correct. Is it to get to the tournament? Yep. I can tell you it's called units. So, and it's based off the television contract. So it fluctuates. It actually goes up every year because the television contract goes up. Um, the to get to the NCAA tournament, to get a bid, it's $2 million. Now, it doesn't come to UAB. It goes to our league. So, for instance, the SEC have how many? Eight teams in. So just the eight teams getting in is $16 million that is spread over six years. So every time you get a unit, it's a six-year payout. And every win is $2 million all the way up to the national championship game. You get paid all the way through the semifinals. So the most units you could get were five, which would be $10 million times six. But it goes to the league, and in the SEC, it was spread uh, amicably. Everybody gets the same. In the American, I believe that's the case as well. Um, and some leagues are different. That's one of the things that Florida State's fighting over. And to be quite frank, I, I'm for Florida State. I think they're right. I, I, they're saying they bring more revenue into the ACC than some of their brethren. Their, their rights, that, so therefore they should get a bigger piece of the pie, and I agree. I think that the teams that earn the right to go to the NCAA tournament should get a bigger piece, not all of it, but they should get a bigger piece than those who don't. But that's how they do it, uh, and, and I think the, the, uh, the NCAA tournament, I think, is still under contract for another eight years, and it goes up every year. Like this year, I think it was $1.163 billion or something crazy. Helps explain why Greg Sankey wants to knock out the automatic qualifiers. Yeah. Scotty. Why do you ask? Yeah. I'm for it. I'm for it. Think about this. Think about the nuts in my business now. Uh, and, and, I mean, we're all a fraternity here, but for a while, they, I can't even call a timeout until the last two minutes. They changed that rule two or three years ago. And I made this point at the convention. I said, anybody that voted for that, raise your hand. Because you're a fool. You're, 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 you're taking control away from you. Like, I cannot stand up at the 16-minute mark and say, Kevin, time out. I have to tell my player who has to tell the – come on, man, and, uh, except under the last two minutes. So, yeah, I'm all for it. I'm, I'm for challenges. Of course, I'm for in-game betting too, so I mean <laughs> – I mean, I think we should embrace it, guys. This thing's about to change now. I think we should embrace it. You should be sitting there on your kiosk. You know how you do with your buddies, at least my buddies. I got some degenerates. But when you sit around and you say, I think Kevin's going to get the next foul or so-and-so is going to make the next free throw. Do you all ever do that or is it just me? Sorry. I'm from Winston County. Sorry. Hey, but, but you do those things. I think you ought to be able to do it live in play. Get UAB gets a cut of it. If you want to say, hey, man, I really like this Axel Lindenberg. Maybe you've had a couple $9 beers and you, feel, and you feel frisky and you want to contribute to his NIL. I think you ought to be able to do it right on the spot. Of course, that's me. <laughs> John. <laughs> well, you try to make your point, you know, or you can do what I did at Memphis and get ejected, you know, and then, and then you say, okay, what is, what do you do after? Well, then after you try to make your case and you try to, you try to, you know, clip up some things that you think were questionable and you try to send it to that guy's boss who's a supervisor and you try to get him to give you some, hey, am I right, am I wrong, am I, am I? but you can't be too harsh because ultimately you don't want that guy looking at you like, well, you turned me in. <laughs> I can't wait to get you again. I mean, they are human beings. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, you've got you've to make sure that they don't get frustrated because, you know, no player has ever committed a foul. I don't know if you've noticed and so they, every time they think that it's not on them, because, because it's like in football they could probably call holding every time. It just so happens when your team gashes one for 14 yards and a first down, there's that flag. You know? So you just got to try to stay in the moment and not, not allow them to get their focus outside of what they can control. Easier, can, easier said than done, but that's, can, the, that's you, the goal. You can't click on a website without – read a story on a website without getting a, you know, a, a pop-up with a link – Tell us how we did. Do you do coaches get that opportunity? Yeah. To yeah. evaluate the officials in an NCAA game? Yeah, you. Well, you after, the, 
after the fact. You obviously. don't get NCAA, but during league play, you, when you when you get your assignments, there is an evaluation that you can turn at after every game. Yeah, uh, my thoughts on NIL, I think it's like most every rule slash law. I think the premise was right. I think it's just gotten completely it, – it, it's turned into something that it was not intended to. But, again, I think it was foolish by the, the power brokers of the NCAA not to understand that this was what it was going to get to rather quickly. Uh, I think things are going to change because everybody talks about sustainability. It's really affected us at, at UAB. And, and, I, and, I, and the sustainability of basically, here's what they're doing. They're asking you to fund their programs. They're asking you, the fan, to, to bankroll their teams. Now, they're also asking you, the fan, to build us a new library. They're also asking you, the fan, to renovate the athletic facilities. They're also asking you, the fan, to build us new tennis courts. They're also asking you, the fan, to pay a surcharge on your ticket prices. And here's what they're also at. You understand? And I know you feel it. Everybody feels it. It's unfair. It's unfair. Uh, I think we're going to get to a, a, a um, employee-employer relationship uh, as it relates to football and men's basketball. And then because of Title IX implications, There'll be some women grouped into that to meet the numbers. I am afraid, I hate to say this, but I'm just being candid. Uh, I'm afraid, again, because of the Title IX aspect and you have 85 football scholarships. We only have 13. We're not that big of a player in it. But because of the 85 football and there's nothing that is equal to that as it relates to women's in athletics, I'm afraid you're going to really start seeing men's sport cut. Um, I, I think, you know, I was, in, I was in the SEC for 12 years at Ole Miss, who has one of the, won a national championship a couple years ago. They have a, a baseball program that thrives. The SEC really is probably the premier conference as it relates to monetizing at least that sport. Uh, they may hang on, but they're going to they're gonna start cutting a lot of sports because they're just not going to be able to afford it. And then the university is going to have to start paying players. Now, NIL is not going to go away. There's gonna, they're, you're still going to have to try to supplement, but there's going to be a salaried – employee, uh, i.e., for um, participation. I think it's coming quickly. One more. Bill. You know, they, they, because of the, again, the, the billion-dollar price tag that CBS and Turner and TBS pay to broadcast the event, you know, there's this thing called Augusta National, and they say there's a certain time of year when those flowers are blooming at their best. Uh, you guys would probably know more about that than I. And, and they, so they really can't mess with those dates. So you'd, you're going to have to figure out a way to move it back, you know, to, to start the tournament a little bit earlier. Let me tell you something crazy, and again, I know you, you guys have all got to go to work, as do I, but uh, I, I'm for elimination of conference tournaments. Uh, I think I think you could start things a, a week earlier. Let's just eliminate them. Let's give the automatic bid to the regular season champ, and let's base where your league is. I think this year the SEC was the second or maybe the third highest rated league. I know Big 12 was one. SEC, I think, was two. Big East was three. So based on that, where your league was rated, we were ninth. The AAC was ninth. That's going to determine how many bids you get in. So for the, for the, the uh, Big 12, let's say if you finish in the top eight, you're in. So you're battling, you know, trying to get in, like the NBA playoffs a little bit. You're battling trying to get in. Let's eliminate uh, conference tournaments, and let's add another two days, uh, three days to the NCAA tournament. You could then get it to about 120-something teams so that you could, you could accommodate the eight best teams in the SEC, and you could still accommodate as a ninth best league, maybe the three best in the American, maybe the two best in the SOCON. You know what I'm saying? So, that, so, so then you could add, and I'm forgiving buys. You remember Coach Bartow, the best team in the history of UAB basketball. Uh, I, I don't want to say the date because I'll be like Jim. I'll have it in the 1990s. 1982. But, uh, uh, yeah, was, yeah, yeah, 1982. Oliver Robinson. So they go to the Elite Eight, which means, okay, you got to win three games. No, they only won two because they got to buy. That, back in those days, there were only 48 teams go to the tournament. So I'm for giving top seeds buys. So, so, you know, and I don't know what that looks like, but if you're UConn and Houston, hey, you get a buy. Let's let the little guys battle each other and see who can play you. I'm for all that. 
and I know people will, will watch it, and uh, I know TV will pay for it, and I think it will solve a lot of our problems. Would you call Greg Sankey and share that with him uh, on, our, on our behalf? Greg used to take my calls. I'm not sure he would anymore. <laughs> Andy Kennedy, thank you. Congratulations on another great hey, thank season. Thank you, guys. I always enjoy my time here. Thank you. You know, we, we are in the presence of champions, Andy Kennedy, Jody, Coach Ford, Coach Asman, Coach Watson, and all of you as well, Jim Conrad, Scotty Colson, John Clements, I could go on and on, all of Wade Kaiser, all of the things that you do all year long, not just in March, to support this great sport. We appreciate it. We appreciate everything you've done this season. This is our last meeting. We ended on a high note. We will be back next year. Make sure you get the survey. John, you had a question, observation. Second that, John. And on that note, make sure you get a copy of the survey, either the hard copy or online. Expect that in your email inbox. Make sure you fill it out. All the insight you can provide, the better. And when you get a moment today, go to kevinskarbinski.com. The wreck of the Bucky McMillan. And you, but you got to read it like this. A chore, a chore, the valiant one for thunder down through the trees. A tomahawk dunk. Well, who would have thunk? He would bring Hunter D to his knees. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.